Hi, my name is Dr. Jay Lim, consultant urologist, and welcome to another episode of Keeping It Simple series, where we discuss common urological issues, their treatments, and their symptoms in a simple and easy to understand manner. Today, we'll be talking about renal colic or urinary stones as more commonly known. It is a sudden and painful condition that can affect up to one in five adult males in their lifetime. The number for females is slightly lower and that is one in 10 ladies can have this condition. And for patients who have stones formed before, up to half of them, or 50%, can have a recurrence within the next five years. The symptoms for renal colic include severe pain, nausea, vomiting, urinary tract symptoms, and even blood in the urine. Urinary stone is predominantly very common in Asia, and this could be due to the combination of the climate that we have, the amount of fluids we drink, and the diet we take. Before I go on, I'd like to remind everybody that this video is best used as an adjunct for patients who have already seen me and have this condition and require surgery. For patients relative who were unable to make it to the consult, this also serves as a good reminder as to what we discuss in the clinic with their relatives. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's topic. So some of the things that we will be covering today would include an overview of how colic occurs and what actually causes the pain, the treatment out there that's possible for this condition, the surgery and how it is carried out, the recovery process, and finally, the complications, which is always an important part of any surgery. Renal colic is a condition that's experienced by a lot of uh, people in this part of the world, particularly Asia, whereby you have a sudden intense amount of pain emanating from the back where the kidneys are. And the pain is usually described more of like a squeezing, relaxing, squeezing, relaxing kind of a condition. It's primarily caused when your kidney makes stones. And these stones uh, drop down into the ureter and essentially obstructs the flow of urine from the kidney into the bladder, uh, which causes the kidney to swell. And this swelling causes stretching of the pain fibers and causes the pain as a result. Now, the incidence of kidney stone, as I said, in this part of the world is a lot higher than, say, a Western world. And so the incidence, or rather the numbers of which it happens, is up to 19% of all male would have stones compared to 9% of female. So what it really means is that it's more commonly occurring in men. Some causes of this condition and why is it so common in this part of the world could be because of the hotter temperature and the climate that we have. We lose a lot more sweat. And if you do not replace the amount of sweat that you lose out, then what happens is this, the body goes into a relative state of dehydration. When dehydration occurs, saturation of the urine occurs, stone starts to form in the kidney. And over a long period of time, the stones, the little stones, crystals get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and they become really, really big stones. Most of the stones that we see in this part of the world are calcium oxalate up to around 70%. Then there are other stones like uric acid stones and um, um, other kinds of stones that mix up dif by different chemical composition, which we probably won't go too much into it. And essentially all of them have the potential to obstruct the urinary system and cause pain. Now, some of the symptoms that you can experience when you get colic is apart from the immense pain is the urgency you get a sensation that you must keep going to the toilet very much like you are having a urinary tract uh, infection or a uti on top of, on top of that you can also get urinary tract symptoms like fever chills or rigos. Chills and rigos is what I describe to my patients whereby you're feeling that it's a very very cold and you're shivering even though the weather outside is bright and sunny. Uh, other things that you can experience include blood in the urine whereby you pee, you don't see yellow color stream, you see red color uh, blood and these are some signs that occur with uh, renal colic. Now, before we go on, I do have one caveat. Renal colic that we're going to discuss today uh, will be limited to those that are caused by fairly small stones. And we say fairly small stones are defined as anything less than one centimeter or 
10 mm. There are patients with bigger stones that require different treatment. Uh, I have seen stones that are as large as 4 to 5 centimeters. Um, these will need to be discussed separately because the treatment available to these stones will be different from what we're going to talk about today. Now, the best way for me to explain what happens in the renal colic is for me to draw. So I'm going to go ahead and draw two kidneys, one on the left, one on the right. We've got a ureter that comes in like here, that travels down to the bladder. And I'm going to draw out how the kidney actually looks more like. And this is how a kidney is in the normal sense. When you have stone, and as we use red color to uh, represent stones, they can grow over many, many years. And what happens if, if urine is continuously made by the kidney and it flows downwards normally and smoothly without any obstruction, everything goes as per normal. It really starts getting a bit more troublesome and let's say if one of the stones decides to drop down here on the other side for example. And the kidney actually looks more like this. So instead of that nice little collapsed kidney that I draw, everything else becomes very swollen. Urine cannot go downwards because there's a blockage down here. And then what happens is the kidney parenchyma, which is this whole region here, has a lot of pain fibers and it stretches because it's getting more and more tender uh, because of the back pressure. And that's actually why you actually experience a significant amount of pain because it's the kidney parenchyma or the fibers on the outside of the kidney that stretches because urine gets accumulated in kidney and causes a significant amount of pain. Now, I've been told that the pain caused by renal colic is much, much worse than pregnancy pain. It's commonly described as 10 out of 10 colicky colicky in nature as per what i've previously explained it's, it's like someone is squeezing you letting go squeezing you letting go and i'm told that it's the worst possible pain that someone can ever imagine experiencing now that you understand about renal colic let's talk about some of the treatments uh, that we can use for this condition first and foremost renal colic causes a lot of pain so naturally Painkillers would form the basis of all treatments involved. Now, depending on whether you have a small or large stones, uh, particularly for patients who is known to be a recurrent stone formers, we know that these stones, they are small and they will pass. And what really, really helps is to push the stone out of the system. When the stone get pushed out of the urinary tract system, the pain resolves almost immediately. The best way for it to push it out is to drink lots of fluids and try to make more urine to increase the pressure from the kidney and thereby pushing the stone lower, lower, lower from the kidney all the way to the bladder. In some times, fluid itself is not sufficient to push the stone down and this could be a combination of either a very uh, weird shaped stone or larger size stones in these cases we can use medications to try to help dilate the lower portion of the ureters and try to facilitate the passage of stones if that still doesn't work then we need to move on and talk about having surgery done now the full name of this surgery is called URS plus LL, which stands for ureteral rhinoscopy plus laser lithotripsy, but it's obviously a mouthful, so here we're just going to call it laser surgery. Surgery for stone removal predominantly is done using lasers nowadays. Well, what we do is uh, that we go through the urethra, uh, through the, the bladder, up into the ureter, look for where the stones are and use laser to break it down. I will go through this part in detail uh, in the following segment, so I won't go through too much here. Now, finally, in rare situation, when patients come to me a bit too late, what happens is that the blockage has already been there for a week or so, and it actually causes infection or sepsis to occur already. 
and when you are septic you have symptoms as per fever chills and rigors that we talked about in this situation instead of doing any of the above intervention we might actually need to put you into hospital and give you intravenous antibiotics so what that does is that it settles the infection uh, before we decide to do anything to remove the stone so don't be surprised if you come to me and say hey doctor that's not what your lecture says you, I thought we we're going to do surgery but instead you put me up to hospital uh, give me lots of medication and did nothing at all the primary reason for that is because when you are septic it is very dangerous for you to go through any surgery as it increases significantly the risk for serious comorbidity or serious complications like death so let's talk about the surgery for uh, kidney stones and how actually it is done in front of you I have a picture uh, on the right side we've got a kidney that has a stone that's causing uh, blockage that prevents you from going down so what we do after you go to sleep is essentially I will go through the urethra and put a long slim instrument with a camera tip up there we will go through the bladder we will go up the ureter and we will attempt to reach the stone once I see the stone I will then basically use lasers to actually break the stones into smaller pieces and remove them bit by bit. Once the stone has been broken down into smaller pieces, the first thing that happens is I will be able to relieve the obstruction and the urine from the top of the kidney starts to flow down into the ureter and into the bladder itself. But that's not at the end of the surgery. I will then need to remove all these black little pieces bit by bit by bit by removing them through the ureter out the bladder so that I can actually give it to you as a souvenir. At the end of this surgery, as you can see, uh, there is this part of the ureter here that's a bit redder. And what I'm trying to show you is the inflammation and the swelling that occurs as a result of the surgery itself. The swelling, as with any swelling that occurs in a narrow, narrow place, can actually cause the ureter to be re-blocked up again even though the stone has been removed. What happens is urine then needs to be recollected again, it causes more pain again, and essentially even though after the surgery is done, you can still experience significant amount of pain. The good thing is the swelling usually disappears after three to four days of rest. So in the meantime, what we do is to put in a ureteric stand in for you. The picture shown here is how a ureteric stand looks like. There are many, many shapes, sizes, and colors out there in the market, but generally they do one similar uh, function. This is a picture of how a stand would look like inside your body. There are little holes in the tips of all these little stand that allows urine to flow from here through the stand bypass the obstruction and come out in the bladder the stands are usually there for about a week or two uh, at maximum then essentially what you then is to require a second very fast five minute procedure to pull out the stand and this is usually done under local anesthetic because it's so fast and it causes only minimal discomfort to you once the stand is removed then essentially the surgery is considered to be complete now let's talk about recovery after the surgery has been done the recovery for this procedure uh, can be broadly divided into three parts um, the first part is right after the surgery itself you will be sent to recover uh, in the recovery suite and depending on how you go if you're feeling up to it and there is a family member or responsible person that's going to take you home you can potentially go home and continue your recovery at home uh, otherwise if you are not feeling up to it or you are having a fair bit of uh, 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 side effects from general anesthesia we can admit you and what happens is the following morning I will come and look at you and make sure you are well before I let you go home so generally uh, you do not need to stay long in hospital even after this kind of surgery is performed 
The second part of the recovery is when you come back. Now, as you recall, you still have a stand inside your body. And if you do, uh, the second appointment is whereby you come back to the clinic and we will arrange for a cystoscopy, which is a small little camera that is put in through into the bladder and we just simply pull the stand out. This whole procedure itself is very short, takes around 5 minutes. Uh, it can be done under local anesthetic, so you do not need to stay in hospital for this procedure. The third part of the follow-up is after the stents has been removed, a some form of imaging, either a CT scan or x-ray needs to be done. When that happens, uh, we will look through the imaging to ensure that the stone that, that was there has been removed completely or at least uh, most of it has been removed and that we will also need to ensure that there are no remaining fragment that causes another obstruction through these images uh, before we can safely discharge you for this episode. Now, even though surgery is a very effective way of uh, treating renal colic, and most patients will actually request I do the surgery as soon as possible, it is important to understand some of the complications that can occur as a result of this surgery and what it entails. Naturally, with any surgery, bleeding is a concern. But in this case, because there is no open wound involved, the chances of bleeding are small and essentially it is just one of those things that you need to be aware of. Infection. As I've already mentioned just now, depending on how long you left it before you come to a urologist to get uh, your problem looked at, some of you can already have severe infection or sepsis on board. When that happens, um, we will then need to treat the uh, infection before we can do surgery. Any subsequent surgery after that, when you break up the stones, some bugs can hide between these little stones and when you break them up, there is a chance that you can get a reinfection or a secondary infection as a result of surgery itself. Stricture and nephrostomy. Um, because we are working in a ureter, and ureter is a very thin and narrow tube, there is a chance that the stone might actually cause damage to the ureteric wall itself. And if the stone is left down there for too long a period of time, what happens is that the, the wall of the ureter can be permanently damaged, therefore causing, causing scars to be formed, and even after the stone is removed, a stricture uh, can occur, and this stricture causes the ureter to be narrower than what it originally is, and obstruction of the urine can then occur again. When that happens, again, urine is blocked up in the kidney, and that can lead to infection, and if there's a serious risk and causes a serious infection, we will then need to put a nephrostomy tube. A nephrostomy tube is a tube a small little hole that is put through the skin straight into the kidney and gives another way for dirty urine or infected urine to come out and this is generally done to remove an infected obstructed system while we let the infection settle itself again it's not common but something that you need to be aware that can happen if you leave it too late now, stand symptoms is also a very important complication. As I mentioned to you, we need to put in stand, which is the rubbery tube that connects the kidney and the blood together. Uh, research has shown that up to 80% of uh, people would experience some form of discomfort. Most of them would tell you that they feel a sense of heaviness, they might see some blood in their urine, but generally they can tolerate the stand. The stands, as I mentioned, are there for a purpose, so ideally it needs to be there to about a week or so for the swelling to resolve before you take it out. And any premature earlier taking out or removal of these stands can actually cause a stricture to occur, so we 
try to avoid taking out uh, earlier than necessary and so stent symptoms of the discomfort associated with stents are something that you need to be aware of and be tolerated. The good news is the stent symptoms usually resolve once I remove the stent by the second visit. Now finally, um, as you understand, stones um, are a, have a life of their own. When I break down stones into smaller pieces because of the fluid pressure and the flow uh, of the fluid, some stones can fly up back into the kidney or flow down straight or some of them refuses to come out even after we leave it, uh, we remove the surgery, we thought that it's small enough to pass it out by itself. Some stones can be particularly stubborn and when that happens, we might need to have another procedure to go back in to remove the remaining pieces of stone. This is something that I try to avoid but unfortunately stones are something I cannot control how they behave nor can I uh, accurately predict whether they will pass down or not. Most of the time I'm correct but you need to understand that if you are a stone former very likely you will form stones again and these kind of procedures needs to be done every time a new stone forms. And with that, we've come to the end of today's program. I hope you had a better understanding of what renal colic means to you and how it can affect you. A gentle reminder that today's program is best suited for patients who have seen me and if you have these kind of symptoms, it's best to make an appointment with your own doctor and figure out what's troubling you. With that, we'll see you next time. Bye.